it's Conrad Thompson from Something to Wrestle With. Me, Bruce Pritchard. And you are watching Wrestling with Regret. Why the hell would I watch your Wrestling with Regret? I regret watching Wrestling with Regret. That's not a real. No. Do you ever take a step back and think about how huge of a role television plays in our lives? Now granted, the internet's probably a bigger tool today, but for many people, TV is where they get their news, their entertainment, where they learn. The television is the most important invention of the 20th century, and here's another bold statement for you. Professional wrestling is a big reason it got that way. Now in the long run, TV probably would have done fine without wrestling, but in the 1950s, it didn't hurt the networks to have it in their lineup. Pro wrestling is easy to understand, it's full of drama and excitement, and perhaps most importantly at the time, it was cheap to produce. Wrestling and television were a perfect fit in those days, much in the way wrestling and the internet work so well together today. The history of wrestling and television is a long and complicated one, the details of which I'll get more into in the coming weeks. But today, I want to talk about one of the most memorable and perhaps the most infamous example of this history, Learning the ropes. Learning the Ropes is a sitcom that ran from September of 1988 to March of 1989. It was produced in Canada and ran on CTV and on syndication in the US. And believe me, you knew this was a Canadian show. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really happy for you. I'm sorry for all the stupid things I said. I'm sorry for what I did, Ellen. I'm sorry for what I did, too. The show starred Lyle Alzado, a former NFL defensive lineman, as a teacher who moonlights as a professional wrestler called the Masked Maniac. While all that's happening, he's also raising his two teenage children by himself. This show is perhaps best known for its crossover with the National Wrestling Alliance, which led to lots of wrestlers guest starring on the show, both in the ring and taking part in scenes with the actors. But in the end, as it was with every sitcom at the time, the biggest takeaway on this show show us how to become a better person 21 minutes at a time. Huh, why does that ending sound so familiar? Alzado's character in this show is Robert Randall, a former football player, <laughs> quite the stretch, who becomes a teacher at a private school and who moonlights as a professional wrestler to help pay for his kids' education. Yes, folks, in this world, a private school teacher needs a second job. To those out there who think teachers are overpaid, you should watch this show. His children, who attend said private school, are Ellen and Mark, played by Nicole Stoffman and Janique Besson. While Stoffman's best days as an actor were behind her by this point, Besson would go on to star in shows like High Tide and, more recently, Murdoch Mysteries, a Victorian-era crime drama that's been going strong for nearly a decade. Mark and Ellen's relationship is typical of sitcom siblings at the time. Ellen is younger but more mature, while Mark's a bit of a dum-dum who just wants to score. The two also take a lot of shots at each other. My prayers were answered. Those are my prayers, dummy. God stopped listening to your babble years ago. <laughs> Dad, with makeup on, I look more like Madonna. With makeup on, you look more like Michael Jackson. <laughs> well, what's Ellen gonna do? I cook dinner. So I ate it. Was there some special reward for Valor? You've made my year by spending, Mark. <laughs> now I can call him a pea brain and you can't deny it. Honey, why don't you go get my dinner? and grab your doggy bowl while you're at it. You can join us tonight. Do you think the people who write for sitcoms have a lot of pent-up animosity toward their siblings? Robert's raising the two kids on his own because his college sweetheart turned wife turned ex-wife and ran off to England to study law. According to the show, she put her law career on hold to raise the kids while Robert got his education degree. Then when it was her turn, she decided to up and go to the other side of the world. We never get to see this character, she almost never reaches out to her own kids, and in an episode where she was planning on coming to visit, she ends up canceling those plans. Well, first of all, you've got to realize that it wasn't because she didn't care about us. But in order to love other people, you have to learn to love yourself first. Okay, yeah, but you can still be an active parent. Continuing down the list of cheesy sitcom tropes, we have Robert's neighbor and best friend Jerry, a psychologist who often barges into their home unannounced and raids their refrigerator. What, can he not afford his own food? Must not be that good at his job if he's not getting any clients. We have three large guys who like to get half-naked and hold each other in strange ways, while a fourth one likes to watch. No, wait, never mind. Brilliant psychologist. Robert's love interest, if you want to call it that, is Carol, a fellow teacher who had a crush on him while they were all in college together. She and Robert's future wife were cheerleaders together. How convenient these two work in the same school now. 
Even after all these years, Carol's pining for Robert, like really hard. You know full well she's in England studying. Fine, but I'm here. Studying you. I've been a bad girl. Want to keep me after school? I've always wanted to be kept. I liked it since college. What does a girl have to do to get you interested? If you ever tire of male bonding, you can always wrestle with me. Carol, you need to learn to be a little more direct. It's okay, it's coming from a lady. That's not real sexual harassment. Oh, and by the way, these two would eventually hook up by the end of the season. So, Carol's uncle is the principal of the school, meaning this show has fewer degrees of separation than the Star Wars universe. And get a load of this fop. You two will make a perfect couple. Did I mention that they'll be serving chipped beef on toast and jello? Instead of two demerits, I'm only going to give you one. To a guy who really knows how to make my wheels spin? Anna White. Oh. <laughs> mm, yes, because an authority figure based in reality would be most unorthodox. <laughs> also, I can't help but get the feeling he's massively unqualified for this job. There's only one place that babies come from. A stork. He's trying to teach that to high schoolers. Where is this, Arkansas? Back to the whole reason any wrestling fan would torture themselves by actually watching this show, the wrestling. Robert's persona, the masked maniac, is essentially a jobber to guys like Tully Blanchard and Ric Flair. And here's a fun little piece of trivia. The man behind the mask in the in-ring scenes is none other than Dr. Death Steve Williams. This role is way more dignified than working the brawl for all. Aside from the actual wrestlers who guest star in the show, Robert is befriended by some other wild characters in the business, including a guy named Q-Ball and Cheetah, a man who thinks he's an actual feline. They basically fit the role of the main characters, drinking buddies you might see on another sitcom. Let's go back and talk about those guest appearances though, because man, they were something else. In one episode, Dick Murdoch crashes at Robert's house after his wife kicks him out, so Robert spends the rest of the episode teaching him how to become a kinder, gentler soul. Why don't you name it? How about Blanche? Oh, that tender... That was my mother's name. That's tender, too. Ah, uh, yeah. She wears her hair the same way. <laughs> That's weird enough, but in a separate episode, the maniac teaches a rugged female wrestler to act more ladylike, a clear homage to the plot of My Fair Lady. Had the show gone for more than one season, maybe Robert could have quit his job at the private school to run a charm school. Ooh, the possibilities. In another episode, Mark has visions of rock star fame after jamming out with Ricky Morton of the Rock and Roll Express. Mark and Ricky slay at the local amateur night, but when Mark goes out on his own, he decides to stick to his studies. The magic just wasn't there without Ricky Morton. The magic just wasn't there without Ricky Morton. Someone wrote that sentence down on a typewriter, on a piece of paper, and then an actor read that piece of paper in front of a camera. Then there was a time that Robert held a party for all of his wrestler friends, including the Road Warriors. I love how supportive Robert is of his son by playing his song at the party. From Ron Simmons, Jimmy Garvin and the Italian Stallion, to the Fantastics, Ivan Koloff, and more, they showcased a lot of the NWA's biggest and brightest stars in this series, and actually used them pretty well given the context of the show. As for other episodes, it's all your basic sitcom fare. Ellen sacrifices a friendship to try and be cool and popular, Robert finds himself in a moral dilemma or two, Robert's boss wants to be friends with him, and Mark makes a pass at Carol after a big misunderstanding. We're part of a worldwide trend here. May, December romances? Heck, if we start now, it'll be March before we get a fair! Before we get our what? It'll be March before we get a fair! Before we get a fair! Before we get a one enough! Boy, you'd have to invent some kind of new technology to figure out what he's saying there. Just like how Detective William Murdoch solves some of the world's biggest cases, Murdoch Mysteries, Mondays at 8 on CBC. Then, of course, there are the sporadic storylines that revolve around Robert keeping his double life a secret. But from whom exactly? The kids know the secret, the best friend knows the secret, all of his wrestler friends know the secret, all that's left in the show is Carol and the principal. Oh no, if she finds out dad's a masked maniac, we're all dead. Why? It's never made 100% clear as to why the secret of the masked maniac is so vital to hold on to. The closest we ever get to an answer is seen in the pilot in a single, almost throwaway line. You see, Mark, people who moonlight on this job get bounced real quick and I want to teach. How would they all get in trouble? The kids aren't wrestling. No one's doing anything illegal here. If Robert got in trouble and lost his job, the worst that would happen to Mark and Ellen would be they have to go to public school. 
But if the mere act of working a second job is the only thing the principal's against, what difference does it make that Robert's wrestling? By that standard, he could be doing literally anything else and get in trouble for it. Driving a cab, making bathtub vodka, cutting hair, making bathtub meth. So when you get right down to it, the entire crux of this show, the one thing that separates it from all their paint-by-number sitcoms of the day is totally expendable. And by the way, Principal, the entire issue of Moonlighting could easily be solved if you just paid the man. Well, I don't know. I suppose I could use the extra money. Money? Surely you just. As far as how wrestling itself is treated on this show, it's kind of a mixed bag. For the people involved, it's simply another day job with their own gripes and issues that often have nothing to do with the wrestling itself. Can you believe this? Me, corporal punishment, and some bum in the front row just doused me with wine. What do they think this is? Who drinks wine at a wrestling show? Did they sneak it in? Those are my kind of people. On the show, wrestling isn't portrayed like a work, but there also isn't any animosity between the wrestlers that makes it come off like a shoot either. The guys go out there, have their matches, and go back to the locker room like nothing happened. At most, there's some gentle ribbing, but they all laugh it off and stay friends. It's kind of nice, actually. I wish the locker rooms I worked in were that friendly. Oh, hey, Ed, what's up? Learning the Ropes ran for 26 episodes before going the way of hundreds of TV shows that came before and after it. Al Zeta, who retired from pro football in 1985, tried to make a comeback in 1990, one year after the show's cancellation, only to be cut from the LA Raiders after suffering an injury during the preseason. He would pass away in 1992 at the age of 43 due to a brain tumor, one that he blamed on his decades of steroid use, though the connection was never proven. I don't want to rag on this show too much, because it's not like I'm saying anything about this show that hasn't been said about things like Saved by the Bell, or Family Ties, or Growing Pains. Learn the Ropes was cheesy and formulaic, the side characters had almost zero character development, the acting was like, nah, what do you expect, it's a sitcom, but my biggest issue with it was, there was really no logic behind its biggest plot point. The wrestling itself rarely impacted the story of individual episodes. There were times the masked maniac was never even mentioned. In those cases, they would shoehorn in some wrestling footage, as if it were out of some contractual obligation with the NWA, instead of a vehicle to move the story along. If you took out the wrestling portion entirely, you just have a show about a single dad trying to balance his life as a parent and a teacher, that'd be fine for a show concept. Not sure it would have helped this one stay on the air longer, but such is the way of situation comedy. If you can find any episodes online or in an old VHS in your uncle's attic, it's worth a look, if only to see the wrestlers interacting with the cast members and trying their hand at acting outside the squared circle. But beyond that, it's just another cornball 80s sitcom. Check back in a couple of weeks when we go from a sitcom about wrestling, in theory, to a bunch of sitcoms with very special wrestling episodes. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. Bye.